próxima apresentação do dia no Infotrends 2013. E o tema é o futuro da mídia, da TV e da publicidade em uma sociedade conectada. Com 25 anos de experiência nas áreas de entretenimento, empreendedorismo e tecnologia, ele é o futurólogo e consultor formado pelo Berkeley College of Music, de Boston, e é autor de cinco livros, entre eles The Future of Content e The Future of Music. Em 2011, fundou a consultoria Green Futurists, com foco em soluções para sustentabilidade. Convido ao palco, aliás, já está no palco, no seu lugar aí, com uma salva de palmas de, todo, de todos, Gert Leonhardt, CEO da The Futures Agency. All right. What a nice introduction. I understood some of it. Bom dia. That's about the range of my Portuguese, I'm sorry. But um, it's really a great pleasure to be here. I've been to Sao Paulo maybe 12 times, and I also like it in Rio. I, can, I guess I can say that, but I've been in Rio a few times. And uh, every time I come back to Brazil, I notice there's a lot of changes. Uh, three years ago, for example, when I was here, a lot of publishers told me that people are still very uh, positive about reading the newspaper, and the advertising in newspaper is fine. And I, I have the stats to prove it. But today, different picture. And I think I, I know some of the reasons that I want to share with you today. So um, if you want to download my presentations on all my free books, you go to my cloud. GERD cloud is a joke. It's really Dropbox. Uh, but GERDcloud.com gets you into my public folder, and you can download all of my free books and the presentation from today. Uh, I will upload it later this afternoon. You can download whatever you want. There's four gigabyte of information there. Uh, my website is futurewithgerd.com, and I'm G. Leonhard on Twitter. So first, as a quick introduction, my company, The Futures Agency, we're based in Switzerland. Uh, our motto is, it wasn't raining when Noah built the ark. In other words, if you want to be ready for your future, you have to anticipate something that doesn't exist. And this is pretty hard to do when you're running a business. You're very concerned with what exists today or next week. But in five years, it's difficult. So we are brought in to help companies figure out what that future is. For example, if you're looking at Apple, six years ago there was no iPhone. It was just starting, I think, six years ago. Now, over 50% of Apple's money comes from iPhone and iPad. Didn't exist five years ago. Same goes for the Kindle. So today, when you're working with a brand or your agency, you are going to very likely have to be in five years, 50% of your money has to come from new places. And that is the mission. My mission is to help you find this. We work with many clients around the world, media companies, technology companies, to uh, fine tune this and figure out where things are going. So this is, of course, our problem, right? When we're running businesses, we're so close to what we do every day that we only see this. When I was a musician and a producer, I worked with the record labels, many of the major record labels. Uh, anybody still remember what a record label is? Yes, you know, one of those guys, EMI, Warner, you know, from the old days. So when I worked with them, you know what they told me? They said, you know, we don't care whether people like us or whether they like the music, all we want them to do is to buy the damn CD or the download, right? They didn't want to talk to consumers. They didn't have any idea, and that was their belief they were doing this, right? All that counts is unit sales. If you have such a tunnel vision, you are very likely going to be dead in five years. Because, you know, how can you have a tunnel vision and, and touch the future? I mean, basically, what I want you to do today is do this. I would like you to touch your future today. Get an idea of what's coming in the next three to five years, not 20 years, that would be difficult. But especially in Brazil, because as you know, all the changes are very quick in Brazil and people are really interactive and doing all kinds of things. I'll cover more on that later. But this is the mission, to touch the future today. So first of all, I want to remind you, uh, talking about the previous presentation, I saw the end of this and the algorithms and the data. I'll talk more about data as well. But here's an important point. If you're looking to find out what the future holds, it cannot be done with logic, not only with logic. 
right? Because basically, logic proves what we already know. And logic gives us an argument to say, well, the customer does X, Y, Z, we'll do it again. Okay? That's logic. That's the left brain. What we need is discovery. Discovery of new business models, discovery of new revenue streams, discovery of new habits. Steve Jobs did not discover, so to speak, the iPad or the iOS, or Jeff Bezos didn't discover the Kindle by, by purpose. They basically had an intuition, a hunch. It wasn't done with the focus group. So this is very important. Today, because all content is becoming digital, there's a great saying by uh, Sophocles, my great Greek friend, nothing vast enters the life of mortals without a curse. Today, everything is becoming digital. Our health data, our movies, our music, our content, our news, our bridge toll. And you know what happens? The curse of that is that we become naked. As we know, the NSA and PRISM and Snowden, because of this, it's so convenient and so addictive to us that the curse is that we become kind of naked. It's like nuclear power. We have nice power and it, it works, but the curse is we can't switch it off, really. We don't know how to solve the biggest problem of getting rid of the nuclear waste. So this is a very big thing about content, is we have this huge opportunity but we also have the confusion, you know, and the, all the other side effects. So I want to start this off by giving you eight definitive futures, which all of you already know. But those are things that are happening around us every day on a global level, and especially here in Brazil. First, of course, social, that's an old hat, but clearly local, mobile, video. 80% of internet traffic in the next five years will be video. Netflix in America sucks up to 25% of all the bandwidth is taken by Netflix. And the BBC iPlayer in the UK sometimes takes half of the internet power to run. So video is huge. And video advertising it will be huge, just as big as, as search advertising and all kinds of video offerings. Cloud. Everything that we do is moving into the cloud. It's also a very scary thought I'll talk about in a second. But uh, essentially, if all our data is moving into the cloud, available pretty much anywhere, over the top. If you ask a 20-year-old today, to some extent, I think also here in Brazil, if they're going to get cable television, what's the answer? What is cable television? I have the internet. Do we need cable or satellite? I think we do, because it's reliable and it has high quality. But a lot of people will go over the top. Big data. This idea of using data to define everything. What people like, when they like it, how they like it, who are they related to. The Facebook graph search, if you know Facebook graph search, is actually so similar to what the National Security Agency does on their search that if you compare the two, what happened just yesterday, it's so similar it's kind of spooky. What it does, it gives us really powerful data. And data will be more important than oil. It's been said many times, data is the new oil. And that's the truth. Because we will have wars over data. I'm not going to speculate much more on this. But we're going to see the financial value, the economic driver of data, will become the defining factor in the next 10 years. And of course, e-commerce. So all these things, why uh, e-commerce is related to, uh, to media, because a lot of broadcasters are now able, through the social television, to offer products on the TV show as part of the show. This is a whole new cup of tea, this collaboration and this convergence of the two. So we're only at the very beginning. And if I go back to the beginning of the internet in 1995, you know, we were looking at all these things and saying it's going to happen tomorrow. It took a little bit longer, but we're going to have this shift, 5 billion people online, the internet of things, machine-to-machine -machine communications, 100 billion connected devices, traffic lights, watches, Google Glass, cars connected to the internet. That will give us a huge amount of information that we can use. We're going to have 50 to 80% of people on mobile devices. 90% of the world will be using what's called social media. 
just a way of interconnecting, especially business to business. Dramatic rise of over the top. Uh, if anybody here is from a telecom company or works for the telco company, SMS will very likely die. Because why should you use SMS if you can use WhatsApp or Twitter or Facebook to send messages, make phone calls? We're talking about $300 million a day that's, that's made with SMS. This is a vast shift going over the top. Automatic language translation, two years away. You can speak in Portuguese, it comes out in Chinese. I think Finnish and Swiss German would be difficult, but pretty much any language, automatic translation of videos, movies, advertising, clips, subtitles, you name it, will have in two years. You can speak on your mobile phone. Will our kids, your kids, still learn languages? It's a reasonable question. Artificial intelligence, auto augmented reality, these sound like science fiction, anticipatory te technologies, technology that can tell me what's going to happen tomorrow and what I need tomorrow. Right? That's already the case with Amazon, you know, simple book recommendations and stuff. 700 to 900 billion dollars spent on advertising per year, and 30 to 50 percent of that on social, local, mobile, interactive on digital. 30 to 50 percent. We're talking about 375 to 450 billion dollars spent on what you guys probably all do every day on digital. And how will that shift happen? Ray Kurzweil says, we're living in an exponential world. And all of you who are in the business of technology, perhaps, or mobile, they know this graph is so true. Because machine technologies and, and what, what we're learning from, uh, from technology is that every day, we're, every day we're getting a, a boost in the range of what it can do. A every 18 months, according to Moore's law, of course. And here's the scary part. If you count one, two, three, four, that's not so much different than one, two, four, eight. Right? But afterwards, it goes like this. So the next step after four is not five, it's eight. So in 18 months, we're going to be four times what we thought we would be, rather have eight than five. And this is very, very important, because humans aren't exponential. People are linear. Right? We don't run faster because we have a faster mobile phone. We don't think faster because we have Twitter. We are still linear. So there is the question about how that fits together. You know, how do we actually build this together? And as I was preparing for this, I, ran, I kept running, running across this uh, theory that this guy wrote about Brazil, the country of the future. Kind of interesting you know, for me as a futurist to come to the country of the future. So it's kind of interesting, I think, that Brazil actually is in a position to formulate and create that future completely different than we are in Europe, because we are saturated, right? we have everything, we have nowhere to go, and we have legisla legislation that prohibits a lot of changes. So what's going to happen in Brazil? I think we're here at this point, we're shortly before the takeoff point of all the digital lifestyles and things that people can do using digital devices, and it will probably only be about three years for a substantial rise in that change. But let me give you a piece of warning. Whatever you do here in Brazil, don't be the next Americans. Okay. It doesn't work. Okay. So if you're thinking about you know, all the things that has been tried in America, okay, now we're finding out it's a bubble. Right. I'm not going to get into much more of this, but basically what you have to figure out, how does this, what you learn from the outside, translate to your culture here? How do people act differently because of technology. Here's one thing, mobile broadband, being able to use the internet on your mobile device is like putting a matchstick in a, in a pile of flame. Right? Because when people start using this, they start interacting, they start uploading, they start watching news differently, they consume differently. It changes your life to have mobile broadband. I was in Bali the other day, and you can have internet everywhere. But I went on a, on a trip in a rice field, and then I said, oh, I, I, have to, I have to tweet, I have to share this. It wasn't working. Right? I realized that I have a lifestyle of mobile broadband, and that changes everything, how we consume, who we vote for, and sometimes we end up like this. I mean, literally, the mobile phone has become our second brain. 
has become a brain outside of our body. If I have a question, right, for example, you know, how do I fix my fungus nail or whatever it is, you know, I just type in, I have the answer. I want to order something in Portuguese, I can have it spoken for me through my app. It's my second brain. Very scary thought. He would also caution, I think this is interesting, but it's not the future. <laughs> if my brain moves outside of my body, then the next destination is here, right? The next destination is a situation to where I think I'm in charge of this machine, but it's really the machine in charge of me. That keeps saying, notification, charge me, share this, do that. So that's also a real danger, I think, that we're seeing. We don't want to live in a world like this. I mean, hands up, who wants to live in a world like this? This is the world of algorithms that defines who your customer is, what they do, what they like, how you track them, what they have purchased, and all. That's all cool, but it's only a part of the reality. Algorithms are needed. But what we really need to be successful is what I call a humor rhythm, you know, a human algorithm. Not like this. One thing is for certain that we're moving now at a very fast pace into what I call the digital default. Everything is connected, everything is available, everything is online, because in many ways it makes a lot of sense to have this, for example here, you know, what happened, what's happened with social media now, Brazil is number two on Facebook use after the US worldwide. And we can watch every movie ever made. Legally or illegally, using Netflix or whatever, we can watch, we can listen to any song ever played, 65 million songs. So when you can read every book that has ever been written, when you can watch any movie that has ever been uh, produced, when you can listen to any song, what, what matters is not distribution. What matters is relevance. It's not important that I can listen to 70 million songs. That, it's cool for a week. Okay? It's the selection that's important. And why does it matter? What should I watch? That is part of the digital default. So I want to uh, use this theme throughout my talk as a theme for you to take home. I think we have to use the Nike commercial here and say, we have to find our greatness here because now we're living in a, in a digital society. What does it mean to be a great society? What does it mean to, to have success and to grow? It doesn't mean to make continuously more GDP every year. Right? You measure the wrong thing, you get the wrong thing. I mean, again, look at America, measuring GDP didn't help much because it went only to 2,000 people. So there's something to think about. I think finding our greatness is important. And what we're talking about in the media business is transformation. We're not talking about putting a Band-Aid on and saying, well, now we're going to create a trick for people to give us the money that they used to give us. This is about radical transformation. This is about a change process that goes on every couple of years to reinvent what we do. Our work, our media planning, our budgets. Business as usual is dead. And let me give you this little shock, okay? Every time I think about this picture, I think about what I do. And I think about how when I talk to people, I have to realize every three months something doesn't work anymore. Something else has happened, and the speed is mind-boggling. Business as usual is dead or dying, depending on where you live. When the Prime Minister of Turkey says, social media is the biggest menace in society, right? you know where he's going to end up. Right? Because he doesn't understand that the business as usual of running a country, much less running a business, is over. As we see here in Brazil, get off your sofa. So for media companies, I work with a lot of really big media companies and small ones, these are the biggest problem. First, you're slow. You're a snail. Right? If you're a snail, it can be fun if you like being a snail, but it's, it will get you run over on the street. The other thing is that you put yourself in the middle. Right? It's my world. Okay? When you run a big TV company or a big publishing house, 
basically you've always gotten used to that things can be set up in such a way that works for me. And that same is true for politicians, of course. Right? But what we have here is that in a, in a connected society, it's not about me, it's about us. Right? It's about uh, creating win-win scenarios for brands, for advertisers, for consumers. If you exploit consumers by tracking their data and abusing it, right, and going to them and spamming them with, with meaningless stuff where they should consume more, they will take action and they will prohibit it. And this is what we're seeing right now in the discussion about media, what's going to happen. Right? Basically, being an empire probably won't work unless you're Apple. Right? And even there, I would say, no longer really working. If your television company or a movie company or a book distributor, argument has been for 30 years that you have to control distribution. Whoever gets to make a copy of the book or the movie or the song and get it for free kills your business. Well, turns out not true. Not true at all because in the music business, for example, they've used copy protection for 12 years Nobody bought anything. And after they stopped using it, they found out that people don't care about keeping something anymore. It's an access. It's about access. It's not about distribution. It's about attention. Control and distribution is a myth, as we can see on this picture. So here's an interesting scenario. Uh, Mark Thompson, who used to run the BBC, took over the New York Times a few months ago. And before he came there, or I think still at this point it's still the same, we have a paywall at the New York Times asking you for a measly $300 per year to subscribe to it. Okay? So whenever you have interest in what the New York Times is writing, you hit the paywall. And what happens at that point, this, this quote comes to mind from Peter Drucker, the economist, who says, the greatest danger in times of turbulence is not the turbulence, it's to act with yesterday's logic. Yesterday's logic will very easily get you killed. Yesterday's logic says it's about scarcity. I cannot let you in until you pay me because what I have is scarce. Well, guess what? Their news wasn't scarce enough. They have one million something subscribers. That's not bad, but for the biggest newspaper in the world, the most reputed writers in the world in English. It's actually not about scarcity, it's about abundance. There's a lot of it. The business model has to take into account that this is an abundant society, abundance of information, abundance of data, not a scarce society, and we can't put scarcity back in. The business model of Netflix, Netflix is here in Brazil, right? Who has Netflix, let me see. We actually pays. Wow, this is this is good. I wish I, you know, I can get it in Switzerland. I know how to, but anyway. Uh, so the great thing about Netflix is not that we can watch movies. I think you would agree. It's cool that we can watch movies, but we can watch movies anywhere. Movies.to or the five thousand other websites. My son says you're stupid. I just go to a website and a place, right? It's not that. It's easier. It's quicker. It's better quality. It has a choice. I can find, see what my friends are listening to. It's the package. Right? That's why we pay for Netflix. It's not scarcity, it's abundance. That's the business model. And that's precisely why a lot of the major studios don't want Netflix to be successful because it removes the scarcity. So we have a paradigm problem here, of course. But the way that the world is shaping up we're heading into this apple and oranges. This is an apple orange or an orange apple. So it's actually both. It's kind of interesting to see that on the outside, we can have abundance, you know, everything is there and you can have all the choices. But on the inside, we can have scarcity, for example, scarcity of attention or scarcity of meaning or scarcity of knowledge or wisdom as we have with writers and journalism. It's actually both. But if I put the scarcity on the outside, nobody is going to get inside to check out my abundance. Right? This is the big thing. Right? You put the scarcity on the outside, nobody is going to care what is in the inside. Unless they have a really, really, really significant reason like the Wall Street Journal. 
because they already know it. You know, they, they have to have that. Tim O'Reilly, a publisher, says in the US about open and close, and this is very important, and he says, open and close are the great dance. Openness is where innovation happens, and closeness is where value is captured. You have to be close at some times to say, well, you know, for this, it's a premium. Right? Or for this, it's free. You have to figure out a way, a combination of those two things. It's not free for all that is the answer, obviously, on the freemium model. So Netflix clearly shows us this. And this is the future of media in Brazil. Okay? It's actually the overlap of media, entertainment, and content providers with technology platforms, telecoms, and infrastructure. It's the two things together. The combined business model creates new revenue models. The future of newspapers and publishers and, and magazines and, and over-the-top video producers and, and record labels is not in them figuring out a new mousetrap for us to pay. It's in a collaborative effort with the other players in the ecosystem. In Europe, we have a company called TDC in Denmark. That's a uh, uh, DSL provider and a mobile provider. And what they have done is they said, look, if we want music to be legal, we make it free. Everybody that has a DSL or a SIM card from this provider gets free music. And they negotiated a flat rate, and now nobody that's using this provider, two million people, none of those people still downloads anything and saves them a huge amount in bandwidth. So this combination solved a huge problem. What we need to figure out is how we can solve this together with those companies that are on the other sides of the table. There will be no digital advertising if we don't solve the privacy problem and the security problem and the permission problem and the regulation and the technology problems. If we don't get engaged as advertisers with what should be private and what should be public, and who can get to that information, we're toast. You know, when you read all the stuff that you read about what happens to our data in the international police state, right? then your first reaction is, you know, I, I want to be an Amish person. You know, the Amish in, in America? I want to move to a farm and raise goats because, you know, it's basically I can't do anything against this. If this is the future of the digital ecosystem of five billion people connected, we're going to have to make it a little bit safer than that. If every person in the world says, do not track, your job is gone. I mean, we're talking about a, a trillion dollars here per year that's spent on advertising and marketing. One trillion dollars combined. If everybody says, we don't want to hear from you because our data is private, then I think we're toast. Social television is a great example of this overlapping. You have this huge ecosystem where people are watching TV and doing something else on a second screen, like voting or ordering something or chatting. And this is a great example of those two rings, you know, technology companies, hardware companies, advertisers, the television people coming together to create a new business. If it wasn't for social television, television would be in deep trouble. I mean, it's a saving grace for television that it's converging with the web. So clearly, there's something to be said about this. This movie from uh, Tiffany Schlein called Connected, and it's a clip from a movie, shows pretty well what's happening is that we're moving into a world of interdependence. Your business model depends on the hardware guys, on the technology companies, on the telcos, on the government. It depends, it interdependence. You're no longer just creating one piece of it, and the other part of that is, of course, that you cannot live in a silo. If you're a publisher, you say, you know, we just write good books, or we make good magazines, or, well, that's great, but you can't just be in that one silo. When you're a publisher, you're a technology company. When you're a technology company, you have to do with content. When you're a telco, you have to look at media. They're all converging. So it's time to get out of the silos or be forgotten. That's also very important for our own work, for what we do, what we understand and what we know about. Because here's the cruel uh, message, and it's actually a good message. You guys are still pretty young compared to me, but we will never return to the good old days. The good old days where people paid for CDs. Not here, in Europe, right? <laughs> 
here they pay to get a copy of it, but we will never return to the good old days of people spending that much money on music. We'll have to think of a new logic. We will never return to the days of where people, the only way to reach people is through mass print publication or mass television. We're not going back there. Look at this graph about music selling, right? Bottom line is, the money has gone somewhere else. You have to reinvent with a new logic and think about something, basically, that is the future. And here's the thing. As much as we like technology, it's actually not about technology. It's the driver, but it's the changes in culture that define our business. What do people do? What are they willing to do? What are they willing to share? How do they talk to each other? How do they communicate? Our culture is starting to look like this. Not like the empire, but like a huge spider web. And this is extremely powerful. There have never been more actions and more activism and more discussions about all the stuff that goes on than in the last three years, because we're all interconnected. That, I think, by and large, is a very good thing. So Paul Barron, in his Network Topologies in 1964, says that we're moving in our society from the left, the centralized, to the decentralized, to the distributed. And you could argue something like, I call this locked, loose, liquid. And in media, it means something like this. The Wall Street Journal, locked. Not per se bad. I'm not saying locked is bad. I'm saying it's, it's centralized. It all comes from the middle. The Huffington Post, decentralized. 6,000 guest writers, a couple of people on staff, very social, right? and Twitter and Facebook, completely liquid. Now, you can see there's a trend, basically, media says the trend is quite clear moving over, the trend is clear as moving towards liquid. But having said that, there is an argument for the other models. It depends on when and where. And it's not either or. For example, it's not just HBO versus YouTube. And it's not an, it's not an either or society. So one of the things that we're struggling with is that we're not living anymore in an either-or world. We live in an and world. So today, I sit on the beach, I read a book. Tomorrow, I'm on the plane, I read my Kindle. The next day, I watch the audio, I listen to the audio podcast of the same book somewhere else. It's, e it's not either-or, it's and. Those things together. That's where I think print has a huge chance. To become part of a world where people actually do both. Where there's double ways of reaching them. It's an end world, as we can see here. That's me on the beach in a different life, you know, at the same time. And of course, the other thing that's happening is that we have machines and machine intelligence rapidly developing to do what people used to do. If you're an editor or a data an analyst, you'll be out of work in a very short time because intelligent software can now do pretty good at doing just that same. If you're a cab driver, 10 years, maybe not here, because of the traffic being a little bit more unorganized. <laughs> but if you're a cab driver in London or Singapore, you'll have a self-driving car doing your job in 10 years. So machines are doing a lot of these things, and I think this is something we have to get used to. We're heading to a perfect storm. When I was preparing this seminar, I read a great piece in The Economist about Brazil and about what happened with the layoffs in the publishing world and all these things. Right? Very interesting pieces I want to show you here, and, and you can read it in The Economist. You just look for the uh, middle class embraces online media publishing in Brazil. One of the points was made by James Zerotsky, how do we stay po uh, profitable in a hostile environment? The other point that was made, that companies are pouring money into Facebook and Google and digital publicity now represents 14%. We have fragmentations of communications that are not good for democracy, as uh, Ricardo Gondor maybe is here, he can comment on this later. And that the media companies have become the target of the protesters because they're seen as the establishment. There's four interesting points here. You go back to the very p f first point. Huh? The question is not how you stay profitable in a hostile environment, but how you use the actual existing environment that exists today to create a new business. Okay. Not anti, but 
proactively. How do you do that? This is from uh, just a little while ago, and uh, the headline says, No signs of newspaper crisis in Asia and Latin America. You guys are over here on the right, right? Obviously, not quite the information today. Reminder is, sometimes it takes longer, but when it does arrive, it's even bigger. And that's what you're witnessing here today, I think. So traditional media companies have lived under a dome. Well, you couldn't get any of this stuff unless you were inside of the dome. You couldn't watch football unless you had cable TV or unless you hijacked the cable TV like we do here. But you had to get inside of the dome. And this was a fantastic world for publishers and record labels and TV companies because inside the dome, it's a pleasure paradise. You can't get in, you don't make money. Whoop, sorry. Wrong button. My thumb has gotten too large, I suppose. But... Okay, and let's be clear about this. I mean, you guys on the advertising and marketing business, some of you at least, media was about providing mousetraps to advertisers, you know, capturing people as part of media. And that kind of mousetrap thinking won't last because people are realizing now that these are mousetraps. And they're moving on to a different dimension. We're no moving on, and I put the E in there a little bit late. We're moving from mousetraps to magnets, from this idea of capturing people, you know, targeting campaigns, military terms, to magnets. The prime principle of Jeff Bezos at Amazon is customer delight. That is his way of looking at the world. He wants to delight customers. Right? He wants to do something for them to do. We're now moving into a world where the future media habitat is the cloud. And in this cloud, it's the consumer that holds the key. And there's a substantial difference there. And of course, it's fragmented. As you can see, there's many ways of doing this. We have a complete loss of attention monopolies, you know, places where you can get everyone. That's fading away. They're still there, but they're also being part of the future. And uh, Reed Hastings, the CEO of Netflix, says he calls this managed dissatisfaction. We've lived in a world in media to where we could figure out how to do this. We weren't really satisfied with it, like downloading songs from iTunes, but it worked, and so we did it, but we were not really satisfied. Now this is ending. People want to be satisfied but because they know it's possible. We're moving into a world where the aggregate of the smaller fish are chasing the big fish. And I think there's substantial change there for media, as we can see here with Netflix again. So here's one of the key points I want to make. We have changing paradigms of media. Okay. First, the past was this, the scarcity of information, the scarcity of access, the scarcity of getting to, st to things. And the past was very big. If you didn't have access, you weren't getting it. In the future, scarcity of access is zero. Anybody, anywhere can get it. And what is becoming scarce is the other part of the equation, is attention. The scarcity of attention, mind share, brain space, time. And there's a big shift in, a, in a advertising and media strategy when it's about attention, right? because then you have to earn attention. You can't always buy all of it. So this is why advertising is becoming content now as well. And you have these interface revolutions like holographics and all these things that you're seeing every single day now, and you're having a very scary development towards the Internet moving inside of our bodies uh, that you'll see in the next couple of years. Okay? So Ray Kurzweil again says, search engines won't wait for you to ask for information. They will know you like a friend. If you try Google now, the app, I think, works on Android and iOS. It actually tells you, before you do something, that something has happened that impacts your decision of what you're going to do next. So when you fly to Rio, it will say, you know, it's raining there, take an umbrella. It will do that, anticipate this. Right? You won't be searching, but you will be searched for. And my, uh, my comment on this is that if my new digital friends, the search engines and social networks, will abuse my trust, I will unfriend them. And this you don't want. 
If you're in the business of advertising and media and marketing, you don't want to be unfriended. So we have to figure out how do we how to divide this line? How do we actually do this? Because now I think advertising is shifting from grabbing eyeballs to getting inside of a head. But getting inside people's head is kind of a tall mission uh, when you think about what that means. That means some sort of engagement and involvement. Right? And I think these really powerful technologies that we're seeing today, they require humanization. You know, because that data that we're giving away is very powerful stuff so that we don't end up with NSA in sight or having up, uh, strings pulled by people in the background that we don't know about. So these are very important questions, I think, for the future of media. If data is the new oil, if that is true, then the gas stations should be licensed. In Bali, when you go with your moped to get gas, you can buy it anywhere. They have huge plastic cylinders and just pour it in there. Anybody can sell gas. As a result, every year, dozens of people die in fires. <laughs> because, you know, anybody can have a huge amount of gas in the back of the store. It's not safe. So, if data is the new oil, then gas stations should be licensed. And this is in the, in the best interest of the advertising community is to figure out how this works because the aberration leads to rejection. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit because we don't have enough time here. Um, I'm actually going to skip ahead quite a bit and also want to take your questions, so I don't want to uh, blow you away with a lot more 50 slides that I had for here. Okay. Um, this slide is very interesting. Uh, it just came out a few months ago. We're talking about the willingness to pay for digital content. If you're looking at this slide here, uh, around the world pretty much on a global scale, I think it's at this point mostly Europe here, uh, the red one or the black one is no and unlikely to do in the future is to pay for content. You see how that big that line is going up to 80%. When you ask people if they're going to pay for content. So here's the question that we have to ask the people. Don't pay for the content, pay for value. When you see the value, then you find a way to pay. I'll give you an example. The Economist, the only newspaper I subscribe to with cash right, for only one reason, not because I like the writers. I, I most, mostly like them, not always. They have very smart reporting. But I don't have time to read the magazine, so what they afford me to do is to listen to the magazine as an audio track when I'm driving. And I'm paying $150 to listen to the magazine while I'm driving. I would never do that if it wasn't for the listening. Right? So I'm paying for the pleasure, the value of having it in this way rather than for the writer. And this is a great example for what we're going to see in the future is the aggregate of things that's important. This is my friend Ross Dawson made this fabulous slide you can download from futureexploration.net where he's saying what's happening here is that there's a hundred reasons why people should pay for content. They're different for everyone. Personalization, filtering, aggregation, timeliness, novelty, all of those things. And our mission is to take this and say, from my product, from my magazine, from my newspaper, from my TV station, this is a value proposition. Right? In the end, it's all about this. Trust, brand, value, and relevance. And you know what? Advertisers will never advertise with you if you haven't gotten this figured out because the value is too thin. The mission is therefore to become indispensable. I think the rule of digital Darwin, you know, digital Darwinism, is that if you can be made dispensable, if people can do without you, they will. Because it's very easy to find a way around you. That's what happened to record labels. So the mission is to become indispensable and to humanize this fire hose of information. That's a, a big part of that. So um, I'm going to skip ahead so we can take two, two or three questions. We still have time here. As you can see, I was vastly optimistic about your, my, my own speed here. Okay, I want to end with this. When you go home today, think about how you're going to do this, how you're going to reinvent yourself and not just put on another wheel or change the color of the car. How are you going to make a robot out of your car? 
because that's what you have to do. You have to reinvent and transform your organization to be ready for this future. A short summary, and then I'll, I'll be off. Business as usual is over. Won't come back. The digital default is here, which basically means everything that we have around us is going digital. Just a question of how and when and at what speed and at what level of involvement and how it costs and all these kind of things, of course. Yes, yes, I know. <laughs> okay. Advertising and marketing is shifting into the future is away from the mouse traps and towards the magnets. If people like what you do and what you have to offer, you can advertise to them. If, if you, they want to be in a mouse trap, they wouldn't do that. Be it indispensable. Add new values. That paragraph I showed you a little slide about added values. Hyper collaboration with the other sectors, technology and others. And discover the new logic. I mean, this is one of the biggest issues that we're having with companies that are in incumbents in the old media. They don't have time to discover anything. How can you expect that you can create your future if you don't have time for experiments? How can you expect to be different when you, every second you have to think about how you can actually deal with what's happening now? Discovery process is crucial. The, the transformation period, distribution, we talked about that. Embrace this interdependence. I can guarantee you that if you're in the advertising business or the publishing business, there will be no success in the future without the surrounding players because the age of empires is closed. Big data. If you haven't looked at big data, what that means and how you can make money with big data and synchronize with your users and respecting their privacy at the same time, you should. The last point is very important. We're heading into an age of the global privacy challenge. In other words, if I have to be naked, if I have to take a red pill or a blue pill, if I have to be on the grid or off the grid, that's a very bad choice. Because the choice would, in the end, be that we're all going to be on the grid and basically completely transparent. Nobody wants that. So we have to figure out how we can use people's data without exposing them to everything else that happens. This is a crucial challenge, I think, for the marketing advertising business to figure out. So find your greatness, going back to my theme from the beginning. I think it's all here, and starting today would be a good choice. Thanks very much for your time.